Oops, sorry. Sorry, guys. Oops. 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 Hold on. Hold on. Sorry about that. I was trying to find the source. Hold on. Oh, boy. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Pray, guys. Sorry for the distraction. I'm like, where's that noise coming from? So hold on. You heard the guy in the background, huh? All right, friend. I love you, friend. Let me just close the door. All right. As you can see, I haven't shaved, friends. I haven't shaved. And as you can see, when I don't shave, I look older. I look more tired. I'm starting to look like Santa Claus, but a skinnier version. Keep praying by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I keep working towards getting healthier, more fit, but more importantly, holier for the glory of Jesus Christ. So we're going to wait. As you can see, I'm very early today because, again, I want you to pray for this precious brother. He's one of my best friends, dear to my heart. I'm not going to give his real name. His name is Child of God. Some of you in Peltok know he is. As you can see, this is his office. This is his home. He allows me to come <clears throat> and use his internet and his room for free to serve you for the sake of Jesus Christ until I get my own place. So please pray for him, his lovely wife, his three children. He's got two boys and a girl. Pray for his family, that the Lord Jesus bless them, watch over them, fill them with the Spirit, and provide for them. And keep praying for me, guys, in Jesus' almighty name. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Pray that God really help me. Like I say, I admit, oh, yeah, Muhammad Ali, I know that uh, Muhammad Hijab got busted like a filthy dog he is. He's no better than his filthy prophet Muhammad, the son of Satan. He's just as perverted as him. And Muhammad Ali, your boy Shemsi did a video exposing Muhammad Hijab, which, which we just posted all over social media. So Muhammad Ali, thank your brother, your Akhi, Shamsi, a Muslim who exposed Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa for corruption. So you got Muslims now exposing that dog, Muhammad Hijab, who won't debate me because he knows better. And he knows better to show his face in the street face to face. Right. So but anyway, you guys keep barking, keep barking. And we're going to expose Muhammad as a son of Satan and expose your God as Satan, because that's who he is. So keep barking, guys. And we're going to destroy Islam by the power of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the fire of the Holy Spirit. We're going to keep exposing. So this is why these guys can't handle it. Right? Yeah. So good to catch. Yeah. See, they're upset. When you have a thug, a jihadi thug, threatening to want to do, do you physical harm, a legal fight, you know you've embarrassed and humiliated them and their prophet. Right? After all, why not debate me and embarrass me intellectually? Because he knows not even his God can refute me because I worship, we worship the true God, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is almighty to save and possesses infinite wisdom. So Muhammad's false God, Allah, is not the true God and cannot refute the servants of the living God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because Muhammad's God, Allah, is actually Satan in disguise. Amen? Right. So far, hold on. Hold on. Right. Sorry about that. So we have a... Uh, Another guy. Anyway. Sorry, folks. Uh, it's starting off bad today because we got even some so-called Christians pontificating, making statements that, again, exposes their ignorance. Guys, let's start, hopefully, by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the mercy of Jesus Christ, as the blood of Jesus cleanses me of my filth and imperfections. Here's what really gets me upset. A lot of things get me upset. Sahih Christian, 
his very name, his presence gets me upset. When he opens his mouth, gets me upset. Huh? You get my point? So Sai Christian gets me upset. So there are a lot of things in this world that get me upset. But one of the things that really make me flip my lid, where I really realize I need the Holy Spirit to change me and preserve me for the glory of Jesus, is when you have a Christian who starts pontificating, making statements, pretending to know the Bible, when in reality, all he exposes is that he's an ignoramus, an idiot, a fool who doesn't know the Bible. Honestly, I can't stand that. I really can't stand that. It really upsets me where I have to ask the Holy Spirit to crucify my flesh, mortify my flesh, and save me from acting in the flesh and sinning because the <clears throat> anger of man, the unrighteous anger of man does not bring about the righteousness of God, right? So pray for me because I am very weak in that area. I've confessed every person on this side of eternity has issues that he or she struggles with, sinful <clears throat> inclinations that he or she struggles with, and the work of the Holy Spirit is to transform us every day to become more like Jesus until finally we are delivered, completely, completely delivered from our flesh and sinfulness. Okay. So pray for me because I do not like the fact that I struggle with unrighteous anger. I want the Holy Spirit to give me the power to control and mortify my flesh for the glory of Jesus Christ. But man, there's a guy that commented, right? Let me, uh, he, let me see. Commented who thinks he knows the Bible and is accusing the early church fathers of heresy for preaching that baptism brings about the forgiveness of sins because of my discussion yesterday. And he quotes 1 John 1, 7. It says, the blood of Jesus Christ washes us from all sins. And you know why that made me flip my lid? You guys want to know why? Does, can anyone know why? We're going to begin in prayer and begin to discussion. Yeah. yeah, but seeing it and controlling it are not the same. Do you actually think, folks, honestly, be honest with me. Do you think the church fathers who poured into the scriptures, who broke down every nook and cranny of the scriptures, who actually spoke the language of the scriptures, because the New Testament, specifically the New Testament, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, the common Greek spoken by the common man, because Greek in the first century had become the international language, the lingua franca, right? So if you belong to different ethnic groups, spoke different languages, the way you would communicate with one another is in Greek. Just like today, it's English, right? It's today, it's English, correct? Where I'm a Syrian, you're Arabic, that person's Mexican, Polish, and we communicate in English because that's the common language. At that time, it was Greek. So the church fathers that I'm referring to, they were Greek. They spoke Greek. Their mother tongue was Greek. Do you really think, folks, honestly, this is where I get upset and livid that these guys think they know what they're talking about. These modern internet warriors that are <clears throat> scholars behind the comment section, behind the internet, but couldn't defend their arguments if their eternal life depended on it. Do you really think, folks, that church fathers like Athanasius and Arrhenius did not read those passages that say the blood of Jesus Christ washes us of our sins? Really? Do you really think that, honestly? Right? Okay. Don't you think that they read those passages that state it's the blood of Jesus Christ that purifies us of our sins? It's the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us from hell. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that pays the debt of our sin. And yet they still spoke about water baptism being the instrumental means, not cause. I don't want to say cause. The instrument through which God forgives you of your sins. Now, were they contradicting themselves? No. Can I explain to you how they could see? Sorry about that, man. I don't want to show you my, my yeah. yeah. It even scares me. Do you want me to explain to you how they could believe that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses you of your sins? And yet water baptism be the means through which God forgives you of your sins? 
You guys want to know why? Can I explain to you why? They could affirm both without there being a contradiction. Now, guys, for the record, for the record, let me repeat what I believe because I believe the Bible teaches this. For the record, I believe in sola fide, that you're justified by the grace of Jesus Christ through faith in him apart from any works you do, faith alone. I know many disagree with me. That's fine. I'm just telling you what I believe. I believe in sola scriptura, that the Bible is the only infallible rule of faith, and it's the ultimate authority by which all other authorities are to be subject to. That's what I believe, okay? You may not believe that. That's fine. Now, let me explain why the Father saw no contradiction between the two. Because it was the blood of Jesus Christ that makes efficacious your water baptism. In other words, your water baptism could not <clears throat> bring about forgiveness of sins had it not been for the blood of jesus christ making water baptism efficacious and acceptable to god you get the point because after all what does water baptism simulate and represent the death of christ and his resurrection that's romans 6 3 to 6 right are you following me you guys listening in other words to the church fathers the reason why god would <clears throat> grant forgiveness of sins through the act of water baptism is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that procures these graces and these gifts. So it's the blood of Jesus Christ that makes water baptism acceptable to God through which God then forgives you of your sins. So water baptism is tied in with the saving effect, the saving power of the blood of Christ. That's what they believe. You get it? Yeah, you don't need to delete Mel Melanie Max. It's okay. She's articulating what I believe. You get my point? Now, I'm not saying I believe in water baptismal regeneration. That's not what I'm saying. The church fathers did. And the reason why they saw no contradiction between the blood of Jesus cleansing you of your sins and water baptism being the means through which God grants you forgiveness of sins is because water baptism is directly connected with the saving work of Jesus Christ, representing his death and resurrection for our sins, and water baptism is made effective and acceptable because of the blood of Jesus. You want me there? That's what the church fathers believe. So when some ignoramus who thinks he knows the Bible, some ignoramus quotes to me 1 John 1, 7, this man is so arrogant and puffed up in his own knowledge that he thinks he's discovered something in the Bible that no one prior to him realized or knew. You see why I get upset? Because that shows me how arrogant, how nasty and arrogant this person is thinking he knows the Bible. You're telling me Athanasius did not know about 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sins. You're telling me that Athanasius did not recall the words of Jesus Christ at the Lord's Supper when he says, This cup is my blood, right, of the covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. You mean these fathers did not know these passages, and they waited for some ignoramus who thinks he's a Christian, knows the Bible, to say, it's the blood of Javeth that cleanseth you of all sins. Poor Athanasius, too bad you're not living in this time to hear this man tell you something that you are completely unaware of. Exactly, Elderish. They're busy. You see why? Now you understand why I get upset, right? You understand why I get livid to the point that I have to ask the Holy Spirit, crucify my flesh, mortify my flesh, constrain me so I don't sin in my anger. Because being angry is not sinful. Because there is righteous anger, being zealous for the things of God, right? But it's when you lose your control in your anger, that's when it becomes sin. Let me show you that. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. 
Ephesians 4, 26, 27. And I challenge this ignoramus. Thank you, Ricky D. Keep praying I lose more. I challenge this ignoramus to show up so I can school him and expose him for the fool he is. Read with me, folks. Okay. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Be angry and sin not. So the Bible doesn't say being angry is sinful. Be angry. Be zealous for the things of God. Passionate for the things of God. But don't sin in your anger. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Right? You guys caught it there? Okay. So let me repeat. I know many of my brothers and sisters here do believe that God will grant forgiveness of sins through the act of water baptism because they believe when you get baptized in the name of the triune God in water, that's when God, because of the death of Jesus, grants you the gift of the Holy Spirit to make you alive and remove your sins because of the death of Jesus, the blood of Christ, and blood of Jesus. In other words, as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue and saves me from error, what the church fathers believed and what many people believe today is that water baptism is made effectual, effective, and acceptable because of the blood of Jesus, not in spite of it or independently from it. Right? I know that's what you believe, traditional Christian. I know many Christians believe that, and historically that's what they believe. I do believe there's a baptism that does save, and it's when the Holy Spirit unites you to Christ, makes you one with Christ. And I challenge the co coward to come here, Helesmos, but he knew better than to show up. Right? So if you see that I'm on a rant, it's because this gentleman upset me. Folks, let me just say something. And let me ask the Holy Spirit to purify me, purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ and fill us with the Holy Spirit after I say this. Because I need the Holy Spirit to show up and fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Traditional Christian, do you want to get blocked, brother? Honestly? Why are you coming here and trying to preach and shove down my throat your beliefs? Okay. Let's now get back to the point. Folks, you need to be a little more humble in your understanding of the scriptures. And why do I say that? Because some people feel so confident in their understanding of scriptures that when someone holds a contrary view, they automatically assume that person doesn't know what he's talking about or she doesn't know what she's talking about. And they're going against scripture and they're heretics. Folks, did you know, let me tell you something. For those of you who believe like me, those of you who believe in sola fide, that you are justified by faith in Christ alone apart from works and sola scriptura, and do not believe that water baptism is an instrument through which God grants you regeneration and forgiveness of sins. Do you know that in the early church, we would have been condemned as the heretics? Did you know at the Council of Nicaea, if we were to say water baptism doesn't bring about the forgiveness of sins, which Jesus earned by his blood, we would have been thrown out of the church. We would have been the heretics. Did you know that? Did you, I, you guys, I'm not lying to you. If I was at Nicaea, and if they said, we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I said, what do you mean, that water baptism? Brings about the forgiveness of sins that Jesus earned by his blood? Yes. And I said, well, I don't believe that. I would have been thrown out of the church. I would have been disfellowshipped, excommunicated. It's because I believe what the Bible teaches, so that the early church fathers believe that. But I respectfully disagree with their interpretation. And I don't say this in arrogance because I can't hold the candlestick to many of these church fathers. They were great spiritual, intellectual giants who proved their love for Jesus by willing to die as martyrs. But still, my allegiance is to the scriptures. And until I'm convinced exegetically that this position is right, I'm going to take a stand and what I believe and I'm convinced the Bible teaches. That's why. To answer the question I was asked by Glenn Argenteno, Argento. And if you want, I'll break down John 3, 5 and tell you why 
Though I believe it's speaking of water baptism, it still does not prove the point that water baptism regenerates you. I can do two sessions today if you want, guys, because I started early. If you want, and we keep up the numbers, want to hit that 300 mark for the glory of Jesus, I can do two sessions. This session I can devote to breaking down John chapter 3, verse 5, which was one of the favorite proof texts of even the early church to prove that water baptism regenerates you. Let's look at John 3, verse 5 first. Yeah, because I don't want to do a three-hour session. In fact, I don't want to do two-hour sessions. I like to keep it at least an hour, no more than an hour and a half, because you know how it is. We live in an age where if you have a session that's more than 10 minutes, people zone out, because I have one person telling me, brother, two hours is too long. I said, oh, but if you can go to a movie and see a movie or a show for two hours and not complain. But when someone does a two-hour session where he's trying by the power of the Holy Spirit to go deep into the meat of Scripture, that's too long, brother. Now, if with Batman versus Superman, I can watch for two hours. Yeah! Right? Okay. Let's look at John 3, verse 5. John 3, verse 5. One more time, and I'm going to begin in prayer. I'm going to bring in prayer. Guys, John chapter 3, verse 5, along with Titus chapter 3, verse 5, were some of the favorite passages that were quoted by the early church fathers to support that water baptism regenerates you, grants you the gift of regeneration by the Spirit and forgiveness of sins. Let's read John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water... And of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, question. I'm here to serve you, and I want the Holy Spirit to guide the conversation and anoint the sessions for the glory of Jesus. So, do you guys want me to unpack the meaning of John 3, verse 5, to show, is it Glenn again? Why, though the church fathers believe water baptism regenerates you, I don't believe that, not because I'm better than the church fathers. I'm smarter than the church fathers. God forbid I'd ever think that. God forbid may destroy my pride. Holier than the church fathers. I can't hold a candlestick to them. But at the end of the day, they're human like me. And I have to submit and bow to the authority of Scripture. And until someone can convince me on the accurate interpretation of the context and languages of the Bible, here's where I stand without condemning them. Because they are brothers and sisters in Christ, our spiritual forebears, whom I can't hold a candlestick to because they prove their love for Jesus by dying as martyrs for Jesus. So I don't want you to think I'm arrogant, right? right. Here, hold on. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. Sorry. I don't want to give the impression that I'm saying somehow I am smarter than them, better than them, holier than them. I am not. I am not. Okay? And I'm being honest when I say this. I am an imperfect sinful vessel of Christ who struggles with issues that beg Jesus to purify me for his glory and count me worthy to be part of that blessed com company. Because the fact is, folks, I would never be so arrogant to say that I am on the level of an Athanasius or an Irenaeus, let alone better than them and smarter than them. God forbid I'd be that arrogant. Kenneth. Why are you asking me about Acts 22.16 and butchering Acts 22.16? Canis Corona, don't misquote scripture in my presence. Acts 22.16, which you're referring to, doesn't say that the water of baptism is what granted him justification unto life. Please don't misquote Acts 22.16. Am I? And you know what's beautiful about my arrogance? In my arrogance, I muzzle filthy dogs like you. You see? You, 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 got it. you got me confused, am I? When a dog like you comes to my 
channel. That means you're not here to learn. You're here to start trouble. And I'm going to treat you like the dog that you are. Am I? Am I? Am I? I right? Okay, guys. Are you ready? They're going to learn soon. Say, Christian. They're going to learn. These agents of Satan, these dogs of Satan are going to learn not to come to my channel because I'm going to embarrass them. I'm going to stoop to their level and muzzle dogs. Proverbs 26, verse 5. Right? I, guys, I think by now people should know, right? That one thing I won't tolerate is someone coming here to attack, to mock, to ridicule, because I'm going to insult you. And I'm going to love it. Love it. <laughs> Igor. <laughs> hey, you know why I do that, by the way? Do you know why I start <laughs> manifesting? <laughs> do you know why I start doing that, guys? Honestly? You want to see that again? We're going to begin in prayer. You know why I do that? Because there's this oneness heretic, an anti-Trinitarian son of Satan, who takes my clips and says, see, look, look, Sam is manifesting. You see, he's got a demon. He's got a demon. So I want to give him more footage. So I want him. So I'm trying to give him a lot more material to work with. Honestly, I went after him and his channel. I said, man, thank you for the publicity. Any publicity is good publicity. So here, let, let's help him out, right? Before I pray, can we can we help him out again? <laughs> Igor! <laughs> Manifest. Exercise. All right. Do you think I give him <laughs> do you think I give him enough footage uh, for a couple of months? How about this? Jerkins! Jerkins! <laughs> what do you think? I think I've given him enough material to last him for a year. He can take step. It's look, look, look at the anti trinitarian He's manifesting. Look at that theme. What's his name? Right? Dead to Darius. Dead to Darius. I know we belong to some. Larry. We ready? We guys ready? Oh boy. Jerk heads. Okay. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, first I come and ask in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit to die to our flesh, to crucify our flesh. And Father, please save us from all our sinful tendencies and inclinations and give me victory for the glory of Jesus, not to be unnecessarily offensive to those who sincerely seek your face and want to know Jesus. <clears throat> and Father, save us from the dogs of the evil one, these dogs, these agents of Satan who want to destroy our unity and our peace and our fellowship, being used of the devil to cause us to stumble. Save us from them, Father, for the glory of Jesus. And please have mercy upon us. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Seal us by your Spirit, Father. And Father, destroy our pride, our arrogance, our wickedness. Keep us humble and teachable, Lord. Please, Lord, save me from my own pride and false sense of humility. Keep me teachable, Father, to be open to the voice of your Holy Spirit, speaking through various Christians. And various groups, so I can become more like Jesus by the power of the Spirit. And I pray that for everyone here. Make us more like Jesus and cover us with the blood of Jesus and wash us in the blood of Jesus. Wash our loved ones, my daughters, in the blood of Jesus. Seal them, seal us by your Spirit and give us wisdom and knowledge and power from your Holy Spirit, Father. And use me to bless your people, Father. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to their ears. Enable me to perfectly recall and interpret scriptures for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. Please, Abba, and fill my throat and my lungs and my chest with the breath of life, the health I need to do this. Please, Abba, have your way and save us from stumbling and sinning, Father. Bless the rest of this day in the power of the Spirit, filled with the joy of the Spirit, as the blood of Jesus Christ is our shield. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Right. Okay. Hopefully, it'll become better as the day goes on. Two days ago, man, that day was hard. Getting attacked by Muhammad Nikab and his boyfriend, and then getting attacked, accused falsely, 
of being a beggar for money and now starting off the day with someone pontificating out of his ignorance. This session I'm going to devote to John chapter 3, verse 5. What does it mean to be born of water and spirit? Now listen, help me to help you, okay? No, you didn't know Muhammad Hijab has a boyfriend named Ali Dawa? Okay, help me to help you, okay? Here's how you can help me so I don't stumble and sin and offend you. Keep your comments relevant to the topic. Don't get into side talks, side issues. If you have distractions of the enemy, ignore them. The admins will take care of it. And even though you disagree with me, don't fight with me. Don't challenge me. Let me let me tell you how we can do this. You can set up a time. You can say, hey, Sam, would you like to come on my YouTube stream or my Skype? And we can have a discussion as brothers or brother and sister and discuss our differences respectfully. But if you come challenging me, then one thing again, Al Dariush is here and Sahih Krishna is here, right? Sahih Krishna, you know who Al is. You know who they are. And even Al knows who you are, but he probably doesn't know you by your name. Anyway, they'll tell you, all three of us, Al and Sahih Krishna, we're all Assyrian. And they'll tell you that for the most part, before we came to know Jesus and fell in love with Jesus, we were street punks, were we not? Like other kids, and some of you can bear witness, growing up in the 80s, we all pretty much lived in the streets. We're all street punks, right, Sedman? You too, right? I mean, Al can tell you inside Christian. So being a Syrian and being street punks, we got pride issues and we don't like to be challenged because there's something about Assyrians when you challenge us, our pride kicks in. We got to prove our manhood and make Jesus save us from that and die to that, right? But I still have that in me, that fighter in me, not because I was a great fighter. I wasn't. If I couldn't beat you up in 10 seconds, it was over for me. If I could knock you on 10 seconds, that's it. I was over because then I get winded and you could beat me silly, silly like a redheaded stepchild. Okay. So when you come and you challenge me, I really struggle because I don't like to be challenged because that brings in my old nature that I go, I have to go into fight or flight mode. I don't want that. I want to die to that. I want to be a humble servant of Jesus and treat you with grace and respect. Redheaded stepchild. That's a, that's an English saying. So help me to help you. If you disagree with me, set up a discussion. I'll come on. We'll discuss respectfully as brothers and sisters. If you can convince me, glory to Jesus, right? Glory to Christ. So if you disagree with me, fine. But don't attack me here in my own channel. Don't start debates. And here goes Halasmos. Yes, here he goes. Okay, guys, everyone be silent. Here's the clown that thinks he knows scripture by quoting 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, as if the church fathers did not know about 1 John 1, 7. Right? Which one? Where is it? Behind you. I'll tell you from there. Yes, hold on. Hold on. So the coward was man enough to show up. Okay, Hilasmas. Hilasmas. You accused, yes, yes, I'm full of pride and I'm going to muzzle you because I'm full of pride. You accused the church fathers of being ignoramuses because you're the only one who discovered 1 John 1 7. 1 John 1 7. You're the only one in this planet that discovered 1 John 1 7. Now you're going to answer my question directly. I want you to explain Acts 2, verse 38. <clears throat> the same Peter who preached the blood of Christ in his epistles says this to the Jews in Acts 2, 38. Watch how quickly I dispose of this idiot who thinks he knows the Bible, who's not going to try to attack me because I'm angry. With you, it's righteous anger for even insinuating that the church fathers don't know what they're talking about because somehow you're God's gift to the church. Acts 2, 38. Let's have fun with this guy. Watch what I'm doing to this guy. And I didn't say they agreed with each other all the time, but they did agree with each other on water baptismal regeneration. Quote a father that denied that water baptism was the instrument through which God granted regeneration and forgiveness of sins. Quote a single father. Let's call your bluff because you pretend to know. Let me just deal with this guy. Don't chime in. Don't text. So notice how he changed the question. You see, this is why I say these guys are jokes. They're agents of Satan. 
Did he not just say the church fathers didn't always agree, but when I called out his bluff to show he's an ignoramus and I said, the church fathers did unanimously agree on water baptismal regeneration. Did you see how he changed the argument? So do you rely on church fathers or God's word? So you rely on man rather than God? As if the church fathers did not rely on God's word. Do you see the arrogance and how repulsive the son of Satan is? You see why I said it won't take me long to expose him? And this is recorded. I want this recorded. Helesmos Elijah 333. He's an agent of Satan. He does not know the Bible. He's dangerous. He should not be teaching. Do you see the arrogance again, guys? Do you see the arrogance? So you depend on man, not on the word of God, as if the church fathers were not depending on the Bible. Do you see the arrogance? Do you see the arrogance? Helesmos, I want you to admit to everyone that the church fathers unanimously agreed that water baptism was the instrument through which God granted forgiveness of sins. Do you agree? Yes or no? Marcus, let me repeat this again. No one said the church fathers are above the scriptures. The church fathers were dependent on the scriptures. So that's an arrogant statement on your part. You guys understand it's not simply appealing to the church fathers. It's appealing to the church fathers who appeal to the scriptures. Okay. Answer the first question, Alasmas. Answer the first question. Do you agree that the one thing the early church fathers unanimously accepted was that water baptism was the means through which God granted regeneration and forgiveness of sins? Yes or no? I'm not asking you, Lucky. I'm asking Elesmas, who thinks he knows the Bible, by assaulting the church fathers. I'm waiting for his answer. Guys, don't chime in. Don't interact with him. Please help me because I want to make it as short as possible. Glenn, you need to get out of here. Don't come here. Who told you to come here? Get out of here, Glenn. Send him on his merry way. I'm waiting, Gilesmas. Don't waste my time. I don't have all day for you because I'm taking me less than 10 minutes to expose you. Why people shouldn't listen to you or go to your challenge. Okay, yeah. You see, guys, he's not going to answer, right? Did we not just quote Ephesians? No, don't delete him, Angela. For the love of Jesus Christ, why are you hiding him? I'm trying to debate him, Angela. Okay. Did we not just quote, quote Ephesians 4.26 saying, Be anger, but do not sin in your anger? Did I, will you not quote Ephesians 4.26? Be angry, but do not sin in your anger. This is righteous anger directed at a clown who thinks he knows the Bible, who could condemn men that you can't even hold a candlestick in. So, Helasmas, answer my question. Stop the tap dance. You're embarrassing yourself in front of everyone. Stop the tap dance. Do you agree that the early church fathers believed in water baptismal regeneration. Yes or no? Quickly. Stop the game. See, guys? You see? He won't answer because he got exposed. You, you catch it now, right? Are you guys seeing it? He's making it about me now. You, ca you see it, right? I want to mention because I want this on record for people when they watch this to avoid this guy because he's an agent of the devil. Helesmos. <clears throat> Helesmos. Elijah 333, he's an agent of Satan who perverts the scriptures, who does not know the Bible. Okay? So now let's move on to Acts 238. Okay? Now watch, he's not going to answer Acts 238 either. Acts 238. I hope I'm not boring you guys here because he's a case study. He's going to prove what I've been teaching you guys over the past weeks and months. Acts 238. Helesmas, listen. No, not everyone who disagrees with me, but someone like you who attacks people who disagree with you. For the record, why am I going after this guy? If this guy told me he doesn't believe in water baptism or generation, I have no problem with it. 
Neither do I. But he condemned those who do because in his arrogance and pride, he thinks he's the only one who's discovered 1 John 1, 7, that it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. I'm attacking you for attacking those who disagree with you like the agent of the devil you are. Okay? So now respond to it. Don't tell me it says the same thing. You said it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. So now reconcile that with Acts 2.38 where Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Show me where Peter mentions the blood of Jesus in Acts 2.38. Show me where Peter mentioned the blood. No, it doesn't say result. Don't play the game with east, the preposition. I'll embarrass you. You don't know Greek. Don't tell me the word east can mean as a result. It can be the cause of something. See? See, the guy thinks he's smart. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? He's going to go to the preposition east. I'm telling you, I'm going to embarrass you. Helesmas, I'm going to embarrass you. You don't know the Greek. Don't play that game with me. You see? Even before he mentioned the preposition east, I beat him to the punch. Did I not? I beat him to the punch. Did I not? Let me give you an example of East meaning that this will result in that. This was the cause of that. Matthew 26, 28. He's going to go to Matthew 3, 11. See, the joke thinks I don't know. Get, let me guess, Elesmas. You're going to quote to me Matthew 3, 11, right? Where John talks about baptism for the forgiveness of sins and uses the preposition East. Hmm, I haven't heard that argument. Huh? Okay. Explain to me Matthew 26, 28, the use of east. Hold on. See, the guy's a joke. Hold on. Just so you guys can learn. One second. Explain to me the use of east in Matthew 26, 28. Here's the link. Okay. Elesmas, when the, our Lord Jesus says, let me read it. This for is the blood of me of the covenant for many being poured out for forgiveness of sins. There it uses the preposition east. What does east here mean when he says his blood is shed for forgiveness of sins? Is it the blood that brings about the forgiveness of sin? No, I, Elesmas, I know you're an ignoramus. You don't understand. You can't give me an example showing that east can mean this when there are other examples that east can mean something else. Do you understand logic or no? Do you understand logic, Elesmas? You thought you're smart and you know Greek. You're quoting an example where east has one specific meaning, but in your dishonesty and arrogance, you don't want us to know that east can also mean something else depending on the context. So since in Matthew 26, 28, it's speaking of the same thing, forgiveness of sins. There Jesus says, my blood is shed for the forgiveness of sins. East, explain to us what east means there. Don't waste my time. What does the preposition east mean in Matthew 26, 28? No, I'm waiting for you to answer. Elesmas, stop playing games. Explain to me what does the preposition east mean? mean in Matthew 26, 28. Elesmas, I'm going to sound like a broken record. Your example will not refute the fact that East has various shades of meaning. You're begging the question in assuming that East in Acts 2.38 has the meaning that your example has. And I'm showing you, you don't know what you're talking about. Let's try it again. What does the preposition east mean in Matthew 26, 28? Folks, this guy, because he's an ignoramus and he's got caught red-handed, is now backed in a corner so he won't respond. But for uh, every one of you, is my point clear? Let me tell you what he's trying to do. Give your example and watch. I'm going to butcher you. Quote it. Stop barking. Quote it. And watch. I'm going to embarrass you. Now, guys, understand what he's trying to do. Because he thinks he knows Greek, 
He's going to quote a passage where that preposition is is used for in order to deceive you into thinking it means this in every place. So it has to mean this in Acts 2.38. I just gave him a counterexample showing that that preposition is means different things in different contexts. You caught it? So even if he gives me an example where East has a specific meaning, how does it prove it has that meaning in Acts 2.38? You get my point? You guys understand what my point is, right? Yeah, we're going to send the master on in a couple of minutes. So this guy thought he knows what he's – this is what I was talking about. People are arrogant who need to be cut down to size. Post your example. Hurry up so I can embarrass you. I'm going to turn your example against you. So I can cut you down a size. Quote your example. Hurry up. And notice he says, I'm not going to give the Greek. But you just did give the Greek. You see what a liar he is? Who appealed to the Greek ace, the preposition? Also pronounced ice. Did I appeal to the Greek or did he do? Who appealed to the Greek? Folks, when I said Acts 2.38, who said East? Who mentioned East right after I anticipated he was going to use that argument? Did he not? Scroll back and quote, he appealed to the Greek preposition East, and he says, oh, I'm not going to give you Greek. You just did. You're the one who appealed to Greek, and you got busted because you don't know Greek, and you're trying to deceive people. Because you thought, I haven't heard the other side, I haven't studied the other side, and I'm ignorant of the other side. This is why I say you're an arrogant twit and agent of Satan. Because you think you know what you're talking about. Okay? Quote your example, we're waiting. It's going to be similar to Matthew 3.11. In a couple more minutes, Lucky. I don't want him to whine and complain like a little girl saying, see, he wasn't listening. No, I'm listening much better than you think. I even know your argument before you give it. We're waiting. This is now the fifth time I'm begging you. Quote your example. Go ahead. Watch. We're waiting. Oh, my goodness. Instead of giving me an example from the New Testament, he's going to give me one in English. Folks, is this guy a joke or what? How many of you agree this guy's a joke? Put a one so we can send him on his merry way. Okay. Send him on his merry way. See, I told you it's going to take me less than 10 minutes to expose this guy. Send this guy out of here. Okay. Okay, folks. You understand? Here's what I wanted you to learn from this ex exchange. Here's what I wanted you to learn from this exchange. Please listen carefully. Okay, here's what I wanted you to learn from this exchange. Don't be intimidated by people who appeal to the Greek and don't know the Greek. Did you guys saw, I anticipated that he was going to appeal to the Greek preposition ace, which the, the way they pronounce it is, Ice, by those who want to pronounce it like Erasmus, the Erasmian way of pronunciation, right? Did you see? I already knew he was going to go there. And you saw that I knew he was going to go to Matthew 3.11, but when I mentioned it, he backtracked. And then I gave him a counterexample in Matthew 26.28 where that same preposition, East, is used and refutes his argument. Do you know why, folks? Folks, when I tell you this, and I say this in humbleness by the grace of Jesus Christ, okay? I have studied these issues for 30 years, not because I'm a scholar or special, and I have listened to all sides to the best of my ability. So I know, I know the argument. So when I give you my opinion on a subject, trust Jesus Christ that he has worked in me in such a way that I have spent time studying the issues. Are you with me there? Trust the Lord Jesus who raised me up for his glory that he has worked in me in such a way that I have studied these issues and I'm not speaking in ignorance and in a vacuum. And I don't want to say that because I don't want to come off as arrogant. 
And now you see why I get upset when people like him think they know and are so arrogant to condemn people who don't think like them. You get my, what was my problem with him? My problem isn't that he doesn't believe water baptism regenerates. My problem is with the statement that he condemned Christians and church fathers for holding that position, calling it heretical, just because he thinks he knows the Bible, when in reality he's an ignoramus who doesn't know the Bible. Renaldi, I've already explained Acts 238 in previous sessions. I only brought it up to show him he doesn't know how to deal with the passage. Okay. So you got a case study right now. I'm thanking the Lord for this. Okay. You saw how another one bit the dust. Why? Because he came arrogantly. Nasty, arrogant individual. Quoting 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin, not water baptism, as if the church fathers were so stupid and ignorant they didn't know that part of the Bible. Do you understand the ignorance and the audacity in making that assertion? Do you understand why I'm angry? Are you seriously telling me Irenaeus, Athanasius, Justin Martyr, did not know that the apostles and the Holy Scriptures taught the blood of Jesus cleanses us of sin? For you to say that, honestly, and then in your audacity, condemn them as heretics and teaching something false. You understand why I get I got upset with him? You understand my point? Believe me when I tell you, if you believe... Water baptism regenerates you, and you're gracious and respectful. We'll agree to disagree, and we're still brothers and sisters. Because as I said, I am not of those who believe that water baptism regenerates. I don't. But I'm not going to condemn you if you believe otherwise. Please don't condemn me. And don't be so arrogant to then condemn so many Christians who believe differently. And notice, I'm actually defending the position I don't hold. I don't hold to water baptismal regeneration. But you saw I defended it because this position doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are passages that can be read to mean that. And many godly men and women in the early church who died as martyrs, glorifying Christ, believed that as well. You're going to consign all of them to hell? Really? Athanasius, who defended the Trinity on the basis of scriptures against the heretic areas who believed in water, baptismal, and regeneration. You mean a man with that brilliance who knew the scriptures inside and out to prove the Trinity and that Jesus is eternally equal to the Father, to silence areas who taught that Jesus is a creature, never read those passages that it's the blood of Jesus, the God-man that atones and forgives? You get my point why I got angry? The question is, where's your mother in the Bible, Swak? She's not there, right? So that means she doesn't exist. So get out of here. Okay. So let me repeat one more time. Let me repeat one more time. I am not against someone who disagrees with me. I am not, a, if you say, Sam, you're wrong about justification, okay, fine. Sam, you're wrong about water baptism regeneration. We believe it regenerates. You don't. That's okay. Agree to disagree with me. But be gracious about it. Don't consign people who believe that to hell, right? And in your arrogance, quote passages as if the other side are not aware of those passages. That's the height of arrogance. The height of arrogance, right? You get my point? You really think the church fathers and these other Christian groups have not read 1 John 1, 7? I'm talking about those who study. I'm not talking about the average person. Now, let me repeat one more time. On the essential doctrines of the faith, 
those doctrines that are core to Christianity, those we cannot agree to disagree. Those are non-negotiables. Those we must come in agreement, otherwise we're not brothers and sisters. But the issue of water baptism or regeneration, in my view, is not an essential doctrine. It's an issue we can agree to disagree without condemning each other. That's my position. I know there are people who don't believe that. No, it is an essential doctrine. I disagree with you. Let me repeat why I disagree. Let me say it again so we can go into the topic. I hope you're not bored with this because I'm losing numbers again. People are getting tired of this. Okay, let me tell you why I don't believe it's an essential doctrine. If water baptismal regeneration is a, a doctrine that's wrong, let's just argue it's wrong. Just let's say, I'm not saying it is, it's wrong. Then that means you must believe, at least from the second century of the church, up until the time of even the reformers, Martin Luther believed in water baptismal regeneration and even infant water baptism. That all of these Christians held to a heretical doctrine, a damnable doctrine, so there were no Christians. That means the church was lost and had to be rediscovered. You see the problem. Do you see the problem? I cannot, with a clear conscience, believe that Jesus, who's God Almighty, allowed the church militant, his church on earth, the bishops who knew the apostles and were their successors, and the bishops after them. I cannot believe that Jesus allowed them to fall into such damnable heresy and allowed them to be cut off from his saving grace and end up in hell because Jesus swore to be with his church till the end of the age and that the spirit of truth would guide the church. And because Jesus cannot lie, he's not a failure, I must believe that this doctrine is an acceptable doctrine to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You get my logic here? Now, the young Sam, the better-looking Sam, the skinnier Sam, meaning me, would have condemned people who believed in this doctrine. But the older Sam, the not as good looking Sam, the stupider Sam, has changed his position because I have struggled and agonized over church history. I'm not a scholar of church history, but I've heard men quoting the fathers, and I've went back, looked at their statements, and I see, by golly, there was one doctrine that the church fathers held in con common unanimously. Water baptism was used by God to forgive sins and bring about regeneration. If this is a damnable doctrine, there were no Christians. No one was saved. Jesus failed. God forbid such blasphemy. I have agonized over this issue for 30 years. That's why I have changed. You know why I changed, folks? You know why I've changed? Not because I want to be a crowd pleaser and tickle ears. And I say this from my heart because I love Jesus I know Jesus is real. I know Jesus is God. I know he's alive. He's all powerful. He is not a failure, cannot fail. Therefore, I have to come to the conclusion this doctrine that was accepted early on must have been acceptable to the Lord. He permitted it, so he didn't think it was damnable. That's why I came to this conclusion. Because of my love for Jesus. And I don't love him enough the way I should. I fail him. May he have mercy on me. But that's why. Yep, Ben Malik Sam. I came to this conclusion. I did not come to this conclusion because I want Orthodox to like me. Catholics to like me. Copt no. As you can see, I do a very bad job of making people like me. I'm usually attacking people, calling them dogs, and they can't stand me because I'm an arrogant jerk. Or so they say. I did it because of my conviction. Jesus is alive. He is alive. He is real. He is reality. He is God. If he wasn't alive, there would be no life. We will see him. He will return. And we will stand before him. And because he's God, he is truth, he's almighty, and he's almighty to save. And he said, no one can pluck the sheep out of my hand. I must believe and come to the conclusion 
that this doctrine of water baptismal regeneration cannot be damnable. Otherwise, the Lord would not have allowed his church to embrace it. You understand why I came to this conviction? And that same conviction has led me to the conclusion that if the doctrine of the perpetual Virginia Mary, which was widespread and became the dominant view early on, even let's say you don't believe that Mary remained a virgin after she gave birth to Christ. She was a virgin when she gave birth to Christ, but she married and had children. If that doctrine, let's assume is wrong, was mistaken and damnable, then Jesus will not allow this to be the dominant position. The fact that he allowed it to be the dominant position concerning his blessed mother means that he permits this belief and accepts this belief. Otherwise, he would prevent the church from embracing this belief, making it the widespread dominant belief. See my point? Same thing with that, Armando, because if you ask the Orthodox and the Catholic, what do they mean faith plus works? They don't believe that faith and works in of themselves save anyone. It's the grace of Jesus that makes your faith and works acceptable to God, whereby God then rewards you because of the grace of Jesus working in and through you. Anyway, this is just to let you know why when I see someone from my own camp, let me repeat this again. We're going to go to John 3, 5. This is why when I see someone from my own camp who believes like me, sola fide, let me say again, I believe sola fide, sola scriptura, starts condemning those who believe in water, baptism, or generation, calling them heretics, I get furious, and then I go after that person, even though that person's from my own camp. Amen, Graham. I love it. Beautifully said. Thank you, Vine. Folks, again, forgive me if I offended you, I caused you to stumble. Forgive me for getting loud at times and angry, but I can't help it because one of my pet peeves, let me repeat it again, one of my pet peeves is that when we have someone who thinks he's a chief, who knows the Bible and starts pontificating and consigning people to hell, that person upsets me and gets me angry and wants me to put him in his place. You with me there? Now, do me a favor. Help me to help you. Don't go into side talks, side issues, and tangents. I'm going to work on John 3, 5 right now and give you the exegesis contextually. Exactly, Vine. Lord bless you all. <laughs> I like what Jojo Monster said. You're a bull in a sacred cow shop, and I know you meant it in love, meaning I am a spiritual bull, not because I look like a bull and I'm shaped like a bull. See, this is what happens when I don't trim my beard and shave. I look older. But you got to admit, though, I do look like one gorgeous, ball-headed, hairy-chinned Assyrian beast. Arr! Folks, before I go to John 3, 5, should I give my enemies, those who hate me and think I'm demonized, more reasons to think I'm demonized? Give them more, more clips you know, to... To download to their YouTube channel, say, look, look, he's demonized. One more time. Exorcist demon. <laughs> yes, I manifested. You're a dog. <laughs> All right. Where's the love? All right. Got to lean up, lighten up the atmosphere. You know, acting that way, I'm going to be single until Jesus takes me home, right? They're going to say, dude, this guy is not marriage material. And you're right, I'm not. I'm thinking about starting a Protestant monastery. You know, there's monasteries for Catholics and Orthodox. I think I'm going to be the first Protestant to start a monastery and devote myself to celibacy. Where is the love you've been dreaming of? All in hell, 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 hell. <laughs> the demon. Of Elvis is manifesting through him. All right. Let's get in. Yep. 
Are we ready now? Let me put on, man, I'm getting a little hot right now. Let me put on the fan. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hurry on again. Accusing me of sin. Okay. In Jesus' name, let's start with John 3, 5. Well. Yeah, too much, man, too much of everything. Whew, that guy really lit me up. Thank the Lord Jesus for that guy, Halesmas, because he really ignited me. Right there, you go. You two again, Taddy. Okay, Taddy. What is it? Are you scared of mirrors or something? All right, here. Hello, bye bye, mirror. Go away, you gin of the mirror. See, Taddy's afraid. Taddy's afraid because he believes that there's a gin in the mirror. Okay, I'm going to protect you, Taddy, from the gin in the mirror. Bad gin, bad gin. Leave Taddy alone. All right. Are you happy now, Taddy? Are you happy now? All right. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, let's regroup and focus. Please, no side talks, not no side issues. Focus with me and help me to help you to serve you for the glory of Christ. And by the way, the jinn of the mirror is the jinn of Muhammad Nikab and his girlfriend, Adi Dawa. Right? But hijab Nikab. Okay, John 3, verse 5. Let's start. Let's begin. John 3, 5. Let's read John 3, verses 3 to 6 for the context. John 3, verses 3 to 6 for the context. Let's focus. Canis, please, Canis, stop repeating the same point about Paul and his baptism. Please. I just said <laughs> John 3, verses 3 to 5. Let's read. John 3, verses 3 to 6. We need 6 as well. We're going to talk about John 3, 5, being born of water and spirit, medic, and see what it means contextually. Read with me. He's posting. John 3, verses 3 to 6. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, Now notice how I understood the Lord. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he's thinking natural birth. Must I be born naturally again? Now our Lord responds, five and six. Guys, please pay attention. Here's where you need to focus to learn. So that's what you're here to do, to learn. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he explains what born again is, being born of water and of the Spirit. Now notice in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. What I want you to notice right away, right away I want you to notice, the contrast between natural birth and spiritual, supernatural birth, right? Right? That which is fleshly is flesh. Born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Must I enter my mother's womb a second time? Notice the contrast between the natural birth, mother's womb, and the supernatural spiritual birth. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So remember this. Keep this in mind by the grace of Jesus as we impact this. Supernatural spiritual verse, a birth as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue versus natural physical birth, right? Everyone with me so far? Because we're going to go step by step, folks. I know I can be boring and dry and sound like a broken record. Step by step. All right. What did our Lord mean that you must be born of water and spirit? Historically, well, let me just say, the dominant interpretation and the earliest interpretation, let me just be quick. And to the point, the dominant interpretation and the earliest interpretation, as evidence in the writings, let's say, of Justin Martyr, is that water here means baptism. Okay? So one view is that's referring to water baptism. Another view says that it's contrasting the water of the womb, natural birth, with the supernatural spiritual birth. Another view says that water here is not physical water, whether the waters of baptism or the water of the womb, being conceived in your mother's womb, but it's being used metaphorically for the cleansing effect, 
the cleansing power of the word of God when you hear it and believe it. Okay, can I repeat those interpretations again? Because there's a fourth one. Are you ready? Let me repeat. That's okay. James White's my brother. I love him. It's okay. He can say what he wants. He's my elder and Lord bless him. Let me repeat the three interpretations and add a fourth one. But I need you to pay attention or I'm going to confuse you guys. Okay. One view says that water here refers to water baptism. We'll get to that. Another view says that water here means the natural birth, the water of the womb. Because you guys know that when you're conceived in your mother's womb, you're basically in a sack, right? A water sack, right? Water of the womb. So it's contrasting the water of the womb, natural birth. Another view says that water here is not physical water, whether the waters of baptism or the waters of the womb of your mother, but it is used metaphorically to refer to the cleansing effect of the word of God that when you hear it, it cleanses you like water. That's the third interpretation. And there's a fourth one. That water here is simply another way of referring to the spirit. Let me repeat that fourth one. When Jesus says, you must be born of water and the spirit, this interpretation says that water is simply another way of saying the spirit so that Jesus literally saying, you must be born of water, meaning you must be born of the spirit. You must be born of water, even the spirit. You must be born of water, that is the spirit. You get my point? Because they'll tell you that when it says water and spirit, they'll tell you that the Greek conjunction and, K or chi, doesn't always mean and. It can mean even. That is, right? So that they'll tell you that in the Greek, it actually means you must be born of water, even the spirit. You must be born of water, which is the spirit. So you guys understand the four interpretations. Do you guys understand the four interpretations? If someone's confused, put a two so I can repeat it one more time. And we look at each interpretation to see which interpretation best fits the context. Okay, two. Joseph, help me to help you. Where are you confused? We got a two here. I'll repeat anyway then. MP, can you not chime in? I love you, MP3. Let me deal with the issue. Okay. Joseph, where are you getting confused? Joseph, I, I'm not asking what you think. I'm telling you the four ways this passage has been interpreted. So don't tell me what you believe it is. Did you understand the four different interpretations? Let me repeat them again. The first interpretation, which is actually the earliest, Sal, and you can find it in the writings of Justin Martyr, is that water and spirit here means water baptism, through which God gives you the spirit. Water baptism. You with me there? The second interpretation, it doesn't matter the order you follow, one, two, three. I'm just ordering it the way I'm doing it. Second interpretation, that water in the context means water of the womb, natural birth, the water of the womb, that you must first be born of water of the womb in order to experience birth of the spirit exactly amniotic fluid second interpretation after all if you're not born of water of the womb you don't exist you don't need the spiritual birth right the third interpretation is that water is not physical it's metaphorical it refers to the cleansing effect and power of the word of god that when you hear the word of god it cleanses you as water cleanses the body right that's the third interpretation Fourth interpretation says that when it says water and spirit, that word and doesn't mean two things. That word and means water, which is the spirit, what they call apexegetic. That this, the word spirit explains what water means. You must be born of water, meaning you must be born of the spirit. Water being a metaphor for spirit. Water being metaphor for spirit. Send Umsia on her merry way. So, okay, now, here's a question that you need to ponder and focus on. What interpretation fits the context of the, con 
the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus is speaking to a person at a specific point in history. The first question you need to ask is, what would these words have meant to Nicodemus and his audience? You with me there? The question every serious student of the Bible needs to ask is, not what this means later on, what it meant to the people that Jesus was addressing, because quoting a passage that's written later on, or by some other author at a different place for a different audience, doesn't tell me whether Nicodemus would have known that information, right? Let me give you an example. Those who say that water is metaphorical for the word of God that you hear and purifies you spiritually will go to John 15, verse 3. John 15, verse 3. John 15, verse 3. Watch here. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You see, see? Water here is a metaphor for the word of God that you hear and cleanses you. Right? Seems to make sense, right? Ephesians 5, 26. Oh, jail. Be patient with me, brother. Ephesians 5, 26. No, not necessarily, not physical reality. I'm going to show you from the context. Okay. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Bam. Jesus cleanses you by the word, which is like water. It's spiritual water that spiritually cleanses you. The water by the word. What water of what word? The word of God doesn't sprinkle water on you, but it does cleanse you spiritually. Right? So it is possible that water here means you need to be born of the word of God that when you hear cleanses you and receive the Holy Spirit. Right? In light of these passages. But here's the problem. Those statements were uttered later. John 15, 3 comes later. Nicodemus wasn't here there to hear that. And we don't know whether Nicodemus would have known what Paul wrote to the Ephesians way later after this conversation. So it is unlikely that water here means the cleansing effect of the word of God because there's nothing in the context to suggest that's what Nicodemus would have understood. So the most important question is, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and showing Nicodemus his need of this reality. So Jesus is obviously going to communicate to him in a way that he understands how he needs to go about to be born again. Yeah, send Canis out of here, about ban him. You get my point? You understand how to do exegesis? Obviously, Jesus wants Nicodemus to be born again. So obviously, he's going to explain it to Nicodemus so Nicodemus is not confused. What in the context would suggest that water there means the cleansing effect of the word? To be honest, nothing. You with me there? How does it cleanse you? It's like, how, how does the blood of Jesus cleanse you, Sal? Don't ask me these silly questions, please. How does the blood of Jesus cleanse you? Okay, so that interpretation doesn't seem to fit the context. Guys, get rid of trolls who are going to be nagging and complaining and distracting because they're not listening. What about the view that says you must be born of water, that is the spirit, meaning that water refers to the spirit. So it's not that you're born of two separate things. You're born of the one and the same thing being described in two different ways. In other words, water and spirit are two descriptions of the same thing. Water is the spirit. The spirit is the water. So if you're born of the water, that means you're being born of the spirit. Does the Bible show that water can be a metaphor for the spirit so it doesn't have to be physical water? Let me repeat it again. Is there evidence that the term water can be used as a synonym for spirit, as a metaphor for spirit, so that Jesus is not saying you must be born of two separate things, you must be born of water and the spirit. 
but he's actually referring to the same thing in two different ways. You must be born of the water, and that water is the Spirit. So to be born of water is to be born of the Spirit. To be born of the Spirit is to be born of water, because I'm not talking about physical water. Do we have evidence for water being a metaphor for Spirit? Yes. John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. I don't know if MP is trying to challenge me by going to 1 Peter 1 23 and ignoring what I said. Unless MP wants to show me that Nicodemus knew 1 Peter 1 23, MP is going to get blocked. John 7, 38 to 39. Read with me. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. So it's not actual physical water, but the Spirit that's being described as water. You see? So water can be a metaphor for Spirit. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So is there evidence from the Bible, MP, what am I quoting to explain the Bible? The Bible, right? The Word of God? So are you again being stupid and arrogant to say that to me? What am I quoting to explain the Bible, if not the Bible, the Word? Send MP out of here. Send him back to his military assignment. Okay? So here we see that water is a metaphor. Water is a metaphor for spirit. So it is possible that when Jesus said you must be born of water and spirit, that word and doesn't mean water and something else, but and can be interpreted to mean water, which is the spirit. In other words, I'm saying be born of spirit, which water represents, which water is a metaphor pointing to the cleansing effects of the spirit when he enters you and transforms you for the glory of Christ. Right? But there's a problem with that interpretation. What's the problem with that interpretation? The problem with that interpretation is John 7, 38, 39 is later than the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. In other words, we must show that Nicodemus would have automatically assumed that water and spirit are not two different things, but one and the same thing. That water is a metaphor for the spirit. It's true that in John 7, when Jesus speaks of living waters, John tells us that's the spirit. But even in John 7, it's not Jesus telling us it's the spirit. It's John, the narrator, explaining that when Jesus said living water, he didn't mean physical water, but the spirit. Right? What am I trying to get at? And I hope I'm not confusing you. If you're going to answer this question accurately, you have to keep in mind, Jesus is communicating to Nicodemus and the audience surrounding him. And he wants them to know that they need to be born again. So obviously, he's going to tell them how to be born again. So whatever interpretation you come up with, it has to make sense to them. Because he's not talking to me, he's talking to them. So I want to know what it meant for them, to them, and how it applies to me today. Right? So I don't believe that Jesus was saying, you must be born of water, which is spirit. I do believe Jesus is speaking of two different things. You must be born of this and that. You must be born of water and the spirit. Right? Let me know if anyone's confused. Let me know. If you're not confused, put it to if you are. If not, let me know. So that I can move on. Anyone confused? So now we're left to two interpretations, both of which are strong, but one is stronger still. Yes, you are stupid, at Matthew Pian. In fact, you're such an agent of the devil, you came back to cause trouble. Tell me you don't belong to Satan by doing that. Why are you here? Get out of here. Send him out of here. Okay, let's focus. Stay here. Focus. 
the two interpretations that best fit the context is natural birth and water baptism. Natural birth and water baptism. Why do I say natural birth? Because right before and after Jesus said you must be born of water and spirit, reference is made to natural birth. Here, let's look at it again. John 3, verses 4 to 6. Send him back to Asheron. That's daily with me, warrior woman. And let me tell you something. Satan is smart, warrior woman. Satan knows what my weaknesses are, and he'll attack you where you're weak. He knows that I get distracted easily by comments. So guess what he does? He sends trolls. Whereas Christian Prince David Wood, they're not phased by comments. For some reason, I'm phased by comments. Okay. Now here, notice what is stated before and after John 3, 5. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Notice, natural birth. And then Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the king God. Now notice six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Natural birth. So in the immediate context, you can make a very strong case that water there refers to natural birth, water of the womb. Because Nicodemus spoke of being born from his mother's womb, and Jesus spoke of flesh birthing flesh. So it's natural birth. So this is one of the strongest interpretations contextually. Right? So you can make a very strong case that water refers to the water of the womb, amniotic fluid, right? Yes, you must be born from a woman's womb in order to then experience the supernatural birth. Because after all, if you're not born of a woman, you don't exist, you don't need the birth from the Spirit, right? You got to be born first naturally of your mother's womb, of the water of the womb, to experience supernatural birth. Because if you're not born from a mother's womb, you don't exist. No, it's not, Petra. I guarantee you, you can't explain it from the text, and I'll embarrass you for being an arrogant jerk who thinks you know what you're talking about again. You see? Another arrogant jerk. Okay. But can I show you what is a stronger interpretation than that one? A stronger interpretation than that one? Even stronger than natural birth, water the womb? Water baptism. Do you know why I say water baptism? This is the interpretation I embrace. I do believe Jesus is talking about water baptism. But hold on. Be patient. Let me finish and explain what I mean. Why do I believe Jesus is talking about water baptism? Let's read John 3.22. After Jesus finishes speaking with Nicodemus, watch John 3.22. Right after he finishes speaking with Nicodemus, notice what he does. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Wow! This is the only place in the four Gospels where we're told that Jesus baptized people in water. John 3, verse 26. John 3, verse 26. Simple Bear, just read. I'm answering your question. Just read. See. John 3, 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Notice they're going to John the Baptist saying, they're all going to him to get baptized instead of you, John. And John says, so be it. I must decrease, he must increase. I was pointing everyone to him. Thank God they're going to him to be baptized. John 4, verses 1 to 2. John 4, verses 1 to 2. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Folks, is it a coincidence? This is the only place in the four Gospels. We're told that Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize people in water 
like John's baptism, right after telling Nicodemus you must be born of water and spirit. Is that a coincidence? Or do you think it's deliberately placed here because John the Apostle wants you to make the connection between water and water baptism? Before I move on, I want it to sink in. Is it a coincidence that after telling Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit, Jesus goes and has his disciples baptize people in water? So the strongest interpretation contextually is that water means water baptism. If I'm just going to limit myself to context and let context speak and not my tradition, it is clear contextually water and spirit doesn't mean natural birth, though that is the second strongest interpretation contextually. But in light of the fact that John tells us Jesus went ahead and had his disciples baptize people in water, like John's baptism means, John wants you to make that connection with water baptism. Right? Before I move on. And it's not the first time I've shared this position. Even Al Darish and... In previous years in my Bible classes, this comes up. But what's the problem is we're creatures of repetition. We have to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God. Right? Now, with that said, what baptism did Jesus have in view? It's not a sign just for Jews. Even Gentiles could get baptized at that time. With that said, let me repeat again. What baptism did Jesus have in view? Can anyone tell me? You must distinguish the later command to baptize in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, from other kinds of baptisms mentioned in the New Testament. When Jesus baptizes in water, what Baptism is Jesus performing, carrying out. What baptism is in view? Can someone tell me? The only person, oh, two people got it. Three people got it. Yep, Joel, Vine, JC, John's baptism which was a baptism acknowledging that you're a sinner and repenting of your sins. He was doing John's baptism. <whistles> God bless you, Joel, Vine, JC. You got it. You got it. So it's not the later baptism that Jesus instructed his followers to carry out in the name of the Father and of the Son, Holy Spirit. It is the baptism of John, which was an act that a person underwent to publicly confess and acknowledge he's a sinner who needs to repent and needs the salvation of God. You with me there? But John's baptism didn't regenerate you. John's baptism didn't grant you the Holy Spirit of life. John's baptism didn't save you. John's baptism was preparatory. It puts you in a state to receive the spirit by which you'd be made alive and forgiven. You with me there? Do you think it's a coincidence that when Jesus starts baptizing, baptizing they go to John the Baptist because he was carrying out the same baptism of John? And the baptism of John, let me repeat again, doesn't forgive, save, or regenerate. The baptism of John was preparatory. It prepared you and put you in a state and a, con in a condition to receive the gift of life from the Spirit and forgiveness of sins by bringing you to Christ. Notice what Graham is doing. He's going on a tangent, and I'm talking about John's baptism. See, this is what bothers me when people come here and not listen, and they want to preach. 
Graham hasn't heard a word I said. Graham Chan, and I'm going to send him back to China to do a Kung Fu movie with Jackie Chan. With me there? English, Joseph M. Joseph M. English. Everyone with me there? But actually, he claims to be a son of China. Okay, medic? Don't don't correct me, sir, before I have to lay hands on you. And where was he born? In Hong Kong? Hmm? Anyway. Everyone with me there so far? I don't care what Joseph agrees or doesn't agree. I'm going to send him on his merry way because he can't prove his position if his life depended on it. You see the arrogance again? You see that, Joel Glenn Davis? You see the arrogance? If I said, defend your position or you're going to go to hell, he'll end up in hell before he defends his position. So I don't care when someone tells me you don't agree. It's what you can prove, right? Right, Joel Glenn? Joseph, I love you more to the point that I'm going to send you on your merry way. Don't tell me you disagree and can't defend your position. I don't know why the admins are letting St. Abbas keep flooding the text. Okay, let's focus, folks. Let's focus. Okay. Let's focus. Contextually, prove me wrong. Explain to me why this is the only place in the Gospels that Jesus has said to command the disciples to, to baptize people in water, like John's baptism, right after saying to Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit. Show me why that was placed there at this moment within this context if John doesn't want to make the connection. Prove me wrong. Go ahead. It's easy to say you're wrong. Prove me wrong exegetically. Habadi, since you're not a Christian, I'm going to disrespect you and send you on your merry way. Send Habadi back to Habachi, all you can eat buffet. Habachi grill. I promise you, by the time we're done, only sincere, genuine students of the Bible will be on our channel. No more distractions. In time, by the grace of God. You'll see. People are going to learn. Life is good. I can't answer that now when I'm trying to answer this question. Okay, now, with that said, uh, Joseph, you see, you did something that I'm going to now block you. You quoted Scott Hahn and Steve Ray. Do you want me to quote you Daniel Wallace and John MacArthur and John Piper, people you don't agree with? Why would you be that silly to quote Catholics that you agree with as if it's going to prove your point? Joseph, what's your problem, man? Do you want me to quote Daniel Wallace? Will you accept Daniel Wallace, who's a Protestant evangelical? What if I quote James White? Will you accept James White? What if I quote John Piper, R.C. Sproul, Dr. DJ, uh, G, uh, James Kennedy, yeah, DJ, James Kennedy. Poor man, I forgot his name. So should I quote them, Joseph? Okay, Joseph, should I quote Calvinists and evangelicals to show you're wrong? Would you accept them, Joseph? Joseph, answer my question. Would you accept them? Joseph, quick, answer. We're wasting time. So why are you telling me Scott Hahn? Why are you quoting people I don't accept as infallible teachers of the word or even as teachers who are always accurate and on the money? In fact, you have Orthodox here, Joseph, who don't believe the Pope is the vicar of Christ and that he sits on the seat of Peter. But Scott Hahn does, and they don't accept that. So are you going to quote Scott Hahn against them to prove that the Pope is the vicar of Christ on earth? Why are you quoting people to me that means nothing to me because it's what you can prove, not who you can appeal to? It's 
See, look at what this guy just did. Send Joseph back to Scott Hahn. Go to Scott Hahn. Learn from him. Don't come back here, buddy. Send him out of here. Block him. I don't want him here. Anyway. All right. Sorry about that, folks. We're going to have some days that are better than others. I'm hoping you learn. Do not pontificate and appeal to authority. That doesn't impress me. Here's the thing I want you to learn. Take what I have to say. Go study it. And if you disagree, that's between you and the Lord. Please, guys. I mean, I don't know how, much, how many times I have to say. Even Andrew Martin. Hold on. Let me see what's going on. Uh, Arturo. Hello. Teaching. I'm not open. I'm in a class right now. Yeah, the Molopa. No, no, beyond a blick because I'm teaching. I'm live streaming right now. I'm doing Molopa. I'll call you in an hour after I'm done. Okay, Lord. All right, that was my older brother. Pray for him. That's my older brother, Arturo. He's been gracious enough to let me live in his home until I get on my feet. So pray for my oldest brother, Arturo, and my other brother, Sal, that God bless them for their love and support because without them, it'd be a struggle. Now, look at even Andrew Martin, my buddy. He sits and listens, and he separates what he thinks is right from what he thinks is wrong from what I say. God bless him, man. Can I repeat again? And I'm tired of repeating myself. And you guys are going to get tired of me. Honestly, you will. I'm getting tired of teaching you guys. You know why? Can I tell you why I'm getting tired of teaching guys? Because I'm getting tired of losing my patience with you guys. I love you guys. You're my brothers, sisters in Christ. And I don't want to keep talking down to you and then scold you like I'm your father and you're my child. Right? I don't want to do that, man. Come on. Who who likes to be chided? Does anyone like to be chided? Especially when you're a Syrian? Forget about it. If I were to chide Sahih Christian and Al Dariush, I'd wake up three days three days later in the hospital. Hey, what happened? Oh, what happened was Al Dariush's fist in my mouth. Oh, really? What happened was Sai Christian's two by four across the back of my head. Really? I thought they're my brothers. <laughs> By the way, Al Darish can pack a mean punch. By the way, yes, yeah, Anna. Let's see what happened. Sorry, I froze. Al Darish can pack a mean punch. He's very muscular, top heavy, and he's got the, the fist of a mule that if he hits you, you wake up three days la later speaking a different nationality, a different language. So if he knocks you out and you're Chinese, you wake up speaking Italian. If he knocks you out in your Arabic, you'll wake up three days later speaking Swahili. And if he hits me, I'll wake up three days later speaking like Zachariah. But brother, when he come to me and he told me, so little Bakara, chapter two, but two thirty. Brother, he has a good question, but brother, you have to make muhalla. All right. All right. Okay, now let's repeat the point. Do you see why I believe that the strongest interpretation contextually is water baptism? Right? Water baptism? No, I get tired for you guys. I'm sorry. I don't want to keep burning you guys. Because is it a coincidence? Let's repeat. Is it a coincidence that Jesus Christ, our Lord, started baptizing through the medium of the apostles in water like John's baptism. Is it a coincidence that Jesus did that right after telling Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit? Is everyone getting it? Is it a coincidence that this is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus baptizes people in water through the medium of the apostles, having them baptize people in water for him, for his sake, like John's baptism, right after saying to Nicodemus, he must be born of water and spirit. Coincidence? Guys, coincidence? Yes or no? No, right? So now, the strongest interpretation contextually is water baptism. But what water baptism was Jesus performing at this mo moment in history? The baptism in the name of the triune God, that's later. That's after Jesus' resurrection. 
This is long before Jesus' death and resurrection. So the baptism that he's performing is the baptism of what? Of who? Let's get that point. Let it sink in. The baptism of what? Of who? You got it, Medic and Ron. Mario, Medic, Riaz. John's baptism, which was a baptism done, acknowledging that you're a sinner who needs to repent. Now, let me ask you a question. Did that baptism give you forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit for spiritual life? Did that baptism of John, which Jesus carried out, grant you forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit for life? No. So you understand this position still teaches that the water baptism that Nicodemus had to undergo does not regenerate, does not give you forgiveness of sins because John 7, 38, 39 told us that the Spirit would not be given until Jesus was glorified in heaven. John 7, 38, 39, folks, do you remember? The Spirit would not be given to a believer until Christ was glorified. That means when Nicodemus and others got baptized by Jesus, they still didn't receive the Spirit. Oh, I hear. Sorry, guys, we're buffering. You notice we buffer right when I'm trying to make a point. Okay, let's repeat it again. Pray in Jesus' name because I want to finish this and do another live stream if you're up for it. We're going to go back to the sons of God issue that Vine asked me about. Okay, let's let's try this again. Okay, listen. It's okay now? Okay. Notice that John's baptism did not grant you forgiveness of sins or the Holy Spirit. Because in John 7, 38 to 39, John 7, 38 to 39, we are clearly told the Holy Spirit would not be given until Jesus was glorified after his resurrection and ascension to heaven. That means that the baptism Jesus performed and the baptism that John performed did not grant anyone the Holy Spirit of life. So that baptism did not forgive and did not regenerate. Right? Because here he put John 7, 30, 38, 39. Notice what 39 says. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. You catch it? So notice that although Jesus is talking about water baptism, he's talking about John's baptism. And still that water baptism that Jesus engaged in did not give the Holy Spirit for life. So that water baptism did not regenerate, did not bring forgiveness of sins. Do you see my point? Why I can affirm it is water baptism and still not hold to the belief water baptism saves you. Because at this point, that water baptism didn't save anyone, didn't give them the spirit. They were not regenerated because of that water baptism. You see the point? Everyone got it? So understand that if I let the context speak, it is water baptism, but it still is not a proof text for water baptismal regeneration. You see the point? You can still affirm it's water baptism and still affirm that water baptism here doesn't regenerate because this water baptism didn't give you the spirit for life and didn't forgive you of your sins. It was a baptism done to put you in such a state and condition to prepare you to receive the Spirit later on who would then forgive you and regenerate you. Yes, Vine, you got it. The, the commission to baptize later on by Jesus is different. Everyone with me there? Before I move on, I want it to sink in. No, let you get it crooked. Jesus is saying to experience the new birth, you have to be baptized for repentance of sins because that puts you in a state 
in which you acknowledge you're a sinner needing salvation. And when you're humble enough to do that, then the spirit will be given to you later on by faith in Christ to cause you to be born anew. Okay, Petra. So let me get you crooked. You're still not getting it. Yes, Vine. Different but necessary. You're getting it. Everyone got it? The baptism of John didn't cause the new birth. I thought it was clear, but this guy didn't get it. The baptism of John was necessary to show you're acknowledging I'm a sinner, need of salvation. And if I need salvation, I need the Savior. Who's the Savior? Jesus. So I need Jesus. And once you trust Jesus, then he sends the Spirit later on to cause the new birth. Exactly, Ike. Everyone there? Before I move on? Even if you disagree with me, take what I have to say, meditate on it, and come to your own conclusion. No, Turb. Why are you asking me a question not related to the context? What's wrong with you Christians here, dude? Honestly. One guy's asking me about baptism, fire, and spirit. And now you guys, you, you guys, can you even pay attention anymore? Or we live in that age where it's all, you know, video games. Petra, John's baptism was necessary to show that you realize you're a sinner in need of salvation. If you didn't get baptized by John, then you're saying that you don't need salvation. You're righteous before God. So Jesus is demanding, Nicodemus, acknowledge that you too are dead in sin, right? You're not spiritually alive, and you need the grace of salvation, which I give, and acknowledge that by getting baptized in water as a public confession, you're a sinner in need of me, the Savior, and then I'll send you the Spirit who will cause you to be born anew. Right? At this point, Drazen, we're talking about historically, historically, at this point in salvation history, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, saying, get baptized in water, and later when the Spirit comes, it will come upon you, and you'll be born anew, because your willingness to be baptized in water shows your admission, Nicodemus, you're a sinner, dead in sin, and you need me, and if you do that, that means you're trusting in me, and then I'll give you the Spirit to make you alive. I have no idea what you mean about the first birth, Petra. If you're pretending to understand what I'm saying and then disagreeing on your pretension, you'll get blocked. What do you mean about the first birth? Let's see if you got my point because I want to block you. Because you don't you think you know what I was saying and you have no clue what I'm saying. What first birth? What first birth, Petra? I want this guy to pretend <clears throat> to know what I was talking about. Because he has no idea what I'm talking about. He's not listening. What first birth are you referring to? I said one of the four interpretations is that water means the natural birth. And I just disagreed with it. So why do you keep saying you disagree with me about the first birth when I disagree with that interpretation? Petra, what part of... That interpretation, I don't accept, wasn't clear when I said this to me is the most accurate interpretation. Why are you pretending to understand my point and then disagreeing with something I did not say? You see what you just did? I said one of the interpretations is that it's contrasting the first birth, natural birth, with the supernatural. And I said, I don't accept that interpretation. So why do you keep saying you disagree with it when I just told you I disagree with it? Here's the view I go with. Why are you pretending to be listening and understanding to my point? Send him on his merry way. Okay. All right. Let's focus now. 
For everyone else, you see, Satan gets upset when we're talking about something deep and meaty. We plead the blood of Jesus to cover us. For everyone else, did you understand John 3, 5? <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. I love you, bro. You understand, number one, the strongest interpretation contextually, historically, is that it's water baptism. That's number one. Number two, it's a specific water baptism. John's baptism. John's baptism was for repentance of sins. So the third point, that baptism didn't forgive anyone, didn't give anyone new life. That baptism was an act in which the one being baptized was making a public acknowledgement confession. I'm a sinner. I need salvation and I need the Savior. And that baptism then prepared you to accept Jesus. And when you accept Jesus, then later, after he's glorified, he would send you the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, you'd be made alive. That's what Jesus is saying in the context. You get it? So understand this view still means water baptism here doesn't regenerate. What am I trying to say? If anyone uses John 3, 5 to prove that water baptism gives you the spirit, they're misapplying the passage. Because though it refers to water baptism, it's talking about John's baptism. And every Christian agrees John's baptism doesn't give you the spirit, doesn't regenerate you. So even my view that it's water baptism still doesn't lead to the conclusion Water baptism regenerates you and gives you the spirit. If you believe that, you have to use another passage because this passage doesn't support it. You with me there? Okay, please, I'd like you to share that, Medic, because I need confirmation because sometimes I feel like a loser and I'm wasting my time and I'm displeasing the spirit. So any confirmation that God gives me through his people would be a blessing to my heart because I get attacked a lot and I also have low self-esteem. For the record, I'm admitting I struggle with low self-esteem. And maybe that's God's way of keeping me, keeping me humble. All right. No, really, Medic? I thank the Lord that the Spirit spoke for me to rebuke you. How dare you listen to something about the Bible and play video games? Shame on you, man. You're here listening to the Word of God and playing video games? Shame on you. Shame on you, man. Seriously. Yes, I do, Irene. I do. No, he's serious, you see? You see what a joke some of these Christians are? You see what a joke, honestly? Here I am talking about something that has eternal consequences, and this joke here, and he wonders why I say that he sucks as an apologist, is playing video games while we're talking about the meaty things of the Word of God. Block this guy from ever coming back to this channel. Block him. Thank you for confirming the Spirit is speaking through me. That means now you're being rebuked. Get out of here. Don't come back, medic. Don't come back to my channel ever again. Block this guy. Please, block him. Come on, admins, quick. Yeah, shame on him. What an insult to the Word of God, to the God of the Bible, and to us. The guy saying, I'm playing video games while we're talking about weighty, meaty issues. Unbelievable. Sad. All right. I'm going to do a second session, Tony, right after this, God willing. For the rest of you who are serious enough and reverent enough of the Lord, reverent enough of the Lord, did you understand why I said water baptism is the strongest interpretation in the context? Because Jesus goes on and baptizes people in water, and the baptism he was carrying out through the apostles was John's baptism. Is that clear? Did you guys get that part? Ike, he's done this so many times where he pretends to be paying attention 
and then chimes in and distracts the room because now he confessed why, because he's playing video games. But for the rest of you, you got it? Bill, everyone, bear with me, folks. I have to clean house. We have too many wishy-washy effeminate ministers who let Christians run, run amok, you know, run havoc, creating chaos and confusion. Someone has to pull in the reins and bring order. Sorry that I have to be harsh. But Vine, this is not the only time. He's done it often, brother. And he can go and listen to the archives. He doesn't have to be here live, Vine. Okay? Someone has to be harsh to maintain order. Sorry, folks. Sorry that I have to be harsh. But, man, this is the Word of God. This is not time to play and joke and insult the Word of God, the people of God. Come on, guys. If it's for an exam, if he's, a, if he's doing an exam to get his medical license, believe you and me, he's not going to be playing video games. If it was a medical exam that he had to study for, he wouldn't be playing video games. But when it comes to the Word of God, you do this. For a stinking job that pays well, you will make sure to focus. But for the Word of God, you're going to insult the Lord, His people, and His Word by saying you're playing video games as I'm preaching? Seriously? Unbelievable, man. God, have mercy on us, Father. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, have mercy on us, and please forgive us, Lord. And help me not to be a hypocrite, Lord. <sighs> My goodness. Anyway. Okay, now everyone got it? Everyone got it? I'm tired of having repeat because of all these satanic distractions. What is the best interpretation contextually? What is the best interpretation contextually? Jesus is referring to water baptism. But what water baptism? John's baptism. What was John's baptism for? A public confession acknowledgement that you're a sinner, you're repenting of your sins, and that you need salvation. So it was a baptism that was preparatory. It prepared you to receive the Savior and His grace if you realize and acknowledge you're a sinner dead in sin, so it puts you in a state, in a condition, to then receive the Spirit later on. So this view says it is water baptism, but this water baptism doesn't forgive you, doesn't regenerate you. It prepares you to receive the Spirit, which Jesus would send later, and later when you receive the Spirit, you'd be made alive. Right? No, it's okay, Vine. You can say, because I know your heart, brother. Clear? So you understand, if you want to prove water baptism regenerates, this is not the passage. Notice, let me repeat. If you believe water baptism regenerates you and gives you the Spirit, this is not the passage to prove it, because it doesn't prove that. Though it speaks of water baptism, it's not the same baptism that Jesus sent his disciples to carry out after his resurrection. Historically, it's referring to a specific baptism, John's baptism, which did not save, did not regenerate, but puts you in a condition, a state, to later receive the gift of regeneration when the Spirit came down on you after Christ was glorified. Everyone got that now. Yes, exactly, Nada. That's 100%. You're on the money. Because he says he's giving earthly things to prove spiritual things or to illustrate spiritual things because he couldn't handle spiritual things. No, J.C. Denton, what you need to do now is simply confess and acknowledge you're a sinner and you need a Savior and confess Jesus as Lord. Remember, J.C. Denton, the point in which this is taking place in salvation history. This is before Jesus has showed up John is sent to prepare people to accept Jesus by having them realize they're sinners. Because if you don't think you're a sinner, then you don't need Jesus. You get it, J.C. Denton? So this was God's way of having people realize they are dead in sin and need the Savior. And who's the Savior? John told them. There he is. So now that you admit to me you're a sinner, you need salvation, right? There's your Savior. Run to him. That's John 1. 29 to 36, where John looks at Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here, let's read it. 
John 1, 29 to 33. Razo, Jesus is worth. Razo, when God tells the Israelites to circumcise on the eighth day, since that Jesus' word is for every generation, do you baptize your eight-day male infant, Razo? Hold on. So I had to laugh. Razo. Hold on, hold on. Protestant wait, man. Hold on. Razo. Jesus' word to Moses was, and to Abraham, is that male infants must get circumcised on the eighth day. Do you baptize your male infants when they're eight days old, Razo? Hurry up, Razo. Don't waste my time not answering. Please. We've had enough trolls wasting our precious time. You got 10 seconds, brother. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Admins. Razo, Jesus told the man with leprosy whom he healed to go and show himself to the priest so that the priest could offer the sacrifices that goes with cleansing of lepers, Matthew 8, 1 of 4. So that was Jesus' word. So when a leper gets cleansed, is he supposed to look for a priest to offer sacrifices in fulfillment of Moses' law? Because that was Jesus' word, Razo. No, Noah, if anyone cared for your discussion, maybe. But since no one cares about you or your discussion, take a hike. Okay. You get there, Razo? Okay. This was actually going to be the second point that I was about to make. And Razo already said something that I was anticipating and I was going to respond to. Here's what I was going to say. Yes. Uh, well, no, John Doe. Let's not get into that. Hold on. Okay. Here's what I was about to say. Listen, here's what I was about to say. Sometimes Jesus's instructions are only applicable for that person or audience at that time. Though we must be born again, the manner in which Jesus describes the new birth may not be applicable <clears throat> for us today, though everyone needs to be born again. Let me repeat. There are ways and times and instructions that Jesus gave that are only specific to that particular audience that do not apply to later generations without denying that the reality of the new birth is for everyone in every generation until Christ returns. Let me explain what I mean. When Jesus says Nicodemus, he has to get baptized in water to experience John's baptism, that is a specific instruction that could only be carried out at that time. Why? Because now we no longer carry out John's baptism. This is the problem with Christians in that they don't know how to read context and understand when a command is historically specific, specific to a particular time, to a particular context, and commands that are universal in scope. This is why we get ourselves in trouble. You with me there? You understand what I'm saying? Let me repeat this again, because this is the point I was coming to. I was going to make it until Razo said something. But what he said dovetails into my point. There are places in which Jesus and his apostles tell people to do something. And that instruction is specific for them, but it's not applicable for all Christians in all generations. So you have to be discerning enough by the grace of God's Spirit to know when this particular instruction or the manner of carrying out an instruction instruction is universal or specific. So when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be baptized in this baptism, that's specific to him because he's not talking to us and he's not talking to the church universal 
throughout all generations. Let me give you an example of what I mean, where Jesus tells someone to do something specific that cannot be applicable for all Christians in all generations. It's only applicable to that person in that time in salvation history. Let me show you. Matthew 8, verses 1 to 4. Matthew 8, verses 1 to 4. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, brother. See, folks, if we're patient, I'll get to these objections. I promise you. If you're patient and don't try to test me and debate me, I'll get to these objections. Okay, watch here. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, I do will, be thou clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now notice, and Jesus saith to him, unto him, See thou, tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Now, Razo, are you going to seriously tell me, because this is the word of Jesus, that if a leper gets cleansed, he has to go find a Levite who's a priest and tell him to offer a sacrifice? This is Jesus' words, right, Razo? Or is this instruction specific for a particular individual at a specific time that's not applicable for all Christians throughout all generations? So what's my point? The being born again is universal in scope. And it's a command for all Christians to the end of the age. But the water baptism part is specific to a particular individual at a specific point in time. Because we do not carry out John's baptism in water. So we can't carry out that part of the instruction. That's why every other place where being born again is mentioned, there is no mention of water anymore. Daniel, I'll tell you in a minute. Just wait, brother. Hold on. Did you know that? Did you know every other place where being born again is mentioned, water is no longer mentioned in conjunction with being born again? Did you know that? Can I prove that to you? Uh, Daniel, wait. I'll get to you, brother. Just be patient. Did you know that, folks? Every other time where being born again is mentioned, there is no longer any mention of water in conjunction with being born again. Did you know that? Did you know that or no? Can I prove that assertion? Yeah, let me prove that to you. Let me prove the assertion that when born again is mentioned, water is no longer conjoined with the new birth. James 1.18. James 1 verse 18. James 1, verse 18. Right here. Let me prove it. Of this own will begat he us. Of his own will he begat us, gave birth to us with the word of truth. No reference to water. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. No reference to water. 1 Peter 1, 3. I just did. That word begat is that God gave birth to us. Yep. Born again. Gave birth to us by the word of truth. No reference to water. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us. That's the new birth. Again, begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1, 23, but we're going to read 22 and 23. Start at 21. 1 Peter 1, 21 and 23. Who by him do believe in God, believe in God, that raised them up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have been purified your souls, seeing ye have purified your souls, in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. 
When you obeyed the truth, we told you to believe in Christ, and you believe in Christ, you were transformed, and by the Spirit, you are now led to love the brethren sincerely, so that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible by the word of God. Wow, no more reference to water, which liveth and abideth forever. Did you catch it? Why is there no longer any reference to water in connection with being born of God, born again? Send Zom Bozo on his way. You guys got it? Why is there no longer any reference to water in connection of being born again, the new birth? Because that part of Jesus' instruction was only applicable to his immediate audience who had to be baptized in John's water baptism to prepare them for the reception of the Spirit who would cause them to be born again. Send Katie on her way too. Come on, admins. You see these children of Satan distracting. Do you guys get it? Did it sink in or no? Did it sink in? I'm just sensing silence now. So let me repeat the point. The instruction to be born again is universal. Every person must be born again until Jesus returns. However, the part of the instruction that stated you must be born of water, which in context means water baptism, that's specific it's no longer part or conjoined with being born of the Spirit because that instruction was given at a particular time in salvation history for a particular people. Am I making sense or no? I don't want to move on until it sinks in because this took me longer than it should have. Someone's confused, put a two. Okay. So let me sum up so we can start a second session if you want me to in about half an hour. If you want me to. If not, I'll stop. Okay. Let me sum up. Jesus' instruction to Nicodemus, you must be warned of water and spirit. In the context meant you, Nicodemus, and those listening, must be born of water, meaning you must undergo water baptism. What water baptism must you undergo? John's baptism. What was John's baptism for? We are told John's baptism was for forgiveness of sins, which meant not that when you got baptized by John, you'd be forgiven and be born of the Spirit. Because the Gospel of John tells us in John 7.39, please listen so you can get the point. John 7.39, that the Holy Spirit that gives life would not be given until Christ was glorified. That means up until Jesus' death, resurrection, glorification, the Spirit did not come upon anyone to cause them to be born again. So when people got baptized by Jesus and his disciples in water, none of them were born again. That water prepared them, placed them in a situation that later on Jesus would then send them the Spirit, and once the Spirit came, they would be made alive. Right? Everyone got it. It's really tired me out. Everyone got that though it's water baptism, it's not a water baptism that regenerates, saves, and gives you the Holy Spirit. Because John tells us no baptism at that time, even the baptism that Jesus had the disciples perform, gave anyone the Spirit. John clearly says that. Though Jesus had people baptized by his disciples, they still did not receive the Spirit. John 7, 39, which Protestant posted. They received the Spirit later after Christ was glorified. 
So what's the point? What's the point? If you believe water baptism regenerates you, John 3, 5 is not a passage that proves your position. John 3, 5 does not support your view. Actually, it works against you because John 3, 5 says that water baptism doesn't regenerate, doesn't forgive, doesn't give you the spirit. So if you're trying to prove that water baptism regenerates you, don't quote John 3, 5. It doesn't support that position. And ironically, Joseph was mentioning Scott Hahn. I actually called in Patrick Madrid show. Patrick Madrid is a top-notch Catholic apologist. It wasn't a show. I'm sorry. It was Catholic Answers Live. I called in the show about a year ago. When I explained John 3 and what water baptism Jesus was referring to, honest to God, he got stumped. He didn't know how to answer. John chapter 3, verse 5. Patrick Madrid, he's a Catholic apologist. When I called in, because he quoted this passage, I said, uh, excuse me, but in the context, Jesus baptized people, and it's John's baptism for repentance of sins. He goes, yes. But then John 7, 39 says, the Holy Spirit was not given to anyone until after Christ was glorified. So that water baptism didn't regenerate. How does this prove your point? He got stumped. He did not answer. Do you know why he got stumped? Because he's simply parroting a passage that he's received from others without thinking deeply about its contextual meaning and its implication. This is why I'm not impressed when you name drop, oh, Scott Hahn, Patrick Madrid, James White, and, and, John MacArthur, and, R.C. Sproul, and, so what? Is John MacArthur on the level of the Apostle Paul? Is Scott Hahn the next great Apostle I'm sorry. Yeah, Peter. So I don't care how many people you quote. So what? You know what Ignatius said? You know what Ignatius said? No, he just did not answer, Vine, and that was it. End of conversation. You know what Ignatius said? I do not write to you with the wisdom of uh, Paul and Peter. You know what he's saying? I am not on the level of a Paul and Peter because they were given miraculous revelations from the Holy Spirit directly. So if you tell me Paul said it, I can't say to you, and? Oh, wait, wait, Paul said it? Then I was the Holy Spirit actually using Paul's mouth. So Paul was giving me the words of the Spirit. I better listen to him and take him seriously. You see the difference? Peter said, well, where? Did, that's when you get, wait, 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 where did Peter say that? Have you understood, Peter? Because I can't say, and so what? Peter said it. But if you tell me Athanasius, and I can't hold the candlestick next to Athanasius, I will never be like that man. That man was a spiritual, theological giant in love with Jesus who was willing to be killed for Jesus. I pray I can be like him in his love and passion for Christ. But still, he's not inspired. He's not infallible like Paul and Peter were. Even the Catholics admit that the Pope doesn't always speak infallibly. He's not impeccable. He says a lot of things that he's wrong and are embarrassment. So not everything he says and does are right. Thank you. You get my point? But if you tell me, if you tell me, Peter said it, Moses said it, then I have to sit back and say, okay, give me the verse. Give me the verse. Let me meditate on it, and I'll get back to you, which is what I did with John 3, verse 5. As you can tell, folks, I have spent time meditating on John 3, 5, begging the Spirit to guide me to correct understanding. And I can still be mistaken, but the Holy Spirit will never be mistaken. But until you can convince me exegetically I'm wrong, I stand here. Now, let me give you the icing on the cake. Do you know why Jesus would have Nicodemus be baptized publicly with John's baptism? Let me explain it to you now. Now, here's where you're going to lose 
the connection because of the chapter divisions. Okay? Here's where you're going to lose the connection because of chapter divisions. Do you know the context of John chapter 3 verse 1 doesn't begin in verse 1. It begins in John chapter 2 verse 23. Did you guys know that? The actual context of John 3 begins in John 2, 23. You guys know that? Are you guys paying attention? Did you know that? Thank you, Uttermost. You're showing that John's baptism is different from being baptized for the sake of Jesus. Let me show you where the context of John 3 verse 1 begins. Focus. This is where I need you guys to text less and read to see if you make the connection. Protestant, start at John 2, 23 and quote all the way to John 3 verse 2. Pay attention or you're going to miss it. Okay, John 2, 23, chapter 3, verse 2. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, pay attention. And the feast day, many, pay attention, many believed in his name when he, they saw the miracles which he did. So many believe because of miracles. Many believe because of miracles. Make that connection. Now notice what Jesus thought about them. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And he did not that any should testify man for he knew what was in man. So it says Jesus didn't trust man because he knew what was in man and he knew man was corrupt by nature. So man is corrupt and cannot be trusted. So Jesus didn't trust anything they said. Many believe because of the miracles, but Jesus didn't trust man because he knew man is corrupt and cannot be relied upon. That's the context of verses 1 to 2. Let's see if you make the connection. Many believed in him, but Jesus didn't trust any of them because man is corrupt by nature. That's why I didn't trust them. Now let's see if you make the connection. There was a man of the Pharisees. So he's a religious guide, a religious leader, a spiritual guide. Named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we, notice the language, many believed in him because of the miracles. So now Nicodemus is speaking on behalf of others. We, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Bam. That's your context. John 2.23 tells us Nicodemus is one of the many who believed Jesus because of the miracles. But like the rest, he was corrupt and could not be trusted because Jesus knew what was in man. And Nicodemus is one of those men who can't be relied on, trusted because he's dead in sin. Bam. You make the connection now? That's why Jesus right away tells him in verse 3, you, Nicodemus, must be born again. John 3, 3. You see how when you read chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, it explains to us why Jesus right away says to Nicodemus, you must be born again because Nicodemus is one of the many who believed Jesus because of the miracles, and he's one of the many that Jesus would not trust, did not <laughs> rely on, because he knew that all men are corrupt. He knew that man inwardly is corrupt, unreliable, untrustworthy, and wouldn't commit himself to any of them. And that's why Jesus goes right away and says to him in verse 3, you must be born again. Do you see how the whole conversation changes when you read chapter 2, verses 23, 25, with verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3? Do you see how it connects? So now you see why Jesus right away said you must be born again? Because John just told you in John 2, 23, 25, all of these men Jesus wouldn't trust because he knew what was inside them meaning he knew they're evil at heart, unreliable at heart, and cannot be trusted and relied upon, and they needed a heart transplant. They needed to be transformed. And who was one of those men? Nicodemus. But it still didn't sink in. You still didn't get it. It still didn't sink in, and you still didn't get the implication. Jesus is talking to a religious leader whom people look to as a guy as an instructor of religion. And Jesus says, 
You're just as dead as all of them. Nicodemus, you're dead in sin. You're unreliable, untrustworthy. You're just as dead as the rest of them. And you too must be born again. Do you accept? Wait, 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 wait. You're telling me, Jesus, this religious leader that we've been looking to and following all these years, trusting him for spiritual guidance. We've been misled because he's just as corrupt and dead as we are and no better than us. Absolutely. Now it makes sense why Jesus is telling Nicodemus. Now it makes sense why he says you must be born of water. Nicodemus, do you agree with me that you too are unreliable? untrustworthy because you two are corrupt inside you're dead in sin you need to be born again do you agree then show me you agree by getting baptized publicly as a sign to the world even though i've been your religious leader i too am a sinner who needs salvation are you humble enough to do that if so get in the water you understand the pressure upon nicodemus for Nicodemus to get baptized in water in front of the view of Israel, he would be telling Israel, folks, I was wrong. I misled you. You look to me as a spiritual guy, but I'm no better than you. I'm just as dead in, as you are in sin, and I need a Savior. I need Jesus. You understand how humbling that is for a man of his stature to do that? You see the pressure on Nicodemus? Now you see why I said Jesus' instruction is specific. It has a specific meaning at a specific time in salvation history. And he's hitting Nicodemus where it hurts the most. He's piercing his heart saying, Nicodemus, do you agree with me you must be born again? Yeah? Get in the water. What water? John's baptism, which is a water, confessing, I'm a sinner too. Dead in sin, I need salvation. Yes, Nicodemus, you need my salvation. You're no better than the rest. You're just as dead as them. Do you agree? Get in the water. As a public confession to Israel, I need a savior. I am not a guy that you'd look to. I'm a sinner like you, and Jesus is the one that we all need to look to. Quite humbling, isn't it? Quite humbling, huh? You understand now how amazing and powerful John 3 is if you interpret correctly in the context. Let me give you an analogous situation and without disrespecting anyone. Can you imagine the Pope, the Pope coming to a Protestant church and saying, I'm a sinner. I need salvation. Baptize me. No, warrior woman, why are you deleting not of her? She's a sister in the Lord. Don't delete her, please. She's one of the faithful ones. Thank you, sister. I know you are trigger happy like me. You understand? That would shock the Catholic Church. That would rock them to their very core. Wait, 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 wait. We look to you as the vicar of Christ on the seat of Peter. And we saw you as Christ represented on earth. How dare you go to a Protestant church and be baptized? What are you saying to us? You, we were misled to follow you? That's similar to Nicodemus. Not on that level, because he didn't have the status of the Pope, but he was, in the eyes of Israel, one of the members of the Sanhedrin, a company of 71 religious leaders whom everyone looked to as their spiritual guide that could be relied upon in telling them what the Bible meant. You understand now how powerful, how beautiful, how amazing Jesus' words are and why he would emphasize water baptism in this context, right? In this context. Why he would say, be born of water, meaning you better get baptized in water and you better perform John's baptism, which was a sign you're a sinner that needs to be saved. You too, Nicodemus. Get in the in the in the sea in the in the lake wherever it was in the river, 
get dipped. Is it sinking in now? I know I tortured guys. We lost a lot of people. Yeah, mister, don't pontificate on John 3 3. If you're saying I misunderstood it, I just spent two hours explaining it, mister, in Pal Talk. Go listen to the beginning. Here it is in a nutshell Luke 7 29 to 30. Luke 7 29 to 30. Luke 7, 29 to 30. Watch here. And all the people that heard him and the publicans, meaning tax collectors, justified God. Notice, they declared that God was right. It says the people and the tax collectors declared that God was right. That's what it means to justify God. They agreed with God and his ways, declaring that God's ways are right. How did they do that? By being baptized with the baptism of John. When they accepted John's baptism, they were saying, God, your ways are right and just, and we accept it. But now notice the contrast in 30. Notice the contrast in 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Bam, that was the point. Nicodemus, are you one of those Pharisees that will reject the will of God for your life to be baptized under John's baptism? Or are you going to agree with God that you're dead in sin, you are dead spiritually, you too need to be made alive, even though people think you're a religious leader, a spiritual guide. When you're not, you're dead in sin. You need to acknowledge that you're dead in sin and acknowledge you need God's salvation, which comes by believing in me. If so, accept this baptism. If not, you reject God's will for your life. Is it making sense now? Making sense? This is probably one of the most important sessions I did because it explains what John 3, 5 means in context. If you allow John 3, 5 to be interpreted in its context, number one, it is about water baptism. Number two, it's about John's baptism in water. Number three, that water baptism doesn't forgive sins and doesn't give the Holy Spirit for regeneration. So even if you believe it's water baptism, still it doesn't argue for water baptismal regeneration because that baptism was John's baptism and no one got saved or was born of the Spirit when they did that baptism because the same Gospel of John says in John 7, 39, the Holy Spirit for life would not be given throughout that entire time until Jesus' resurrection and glorification. So even though it's water baptism, it still doesn't regenerate you. Number four, the reason why Jesus said this is because he's confronting a religious leader. Someone that everyone looked to and believed was rightly guided, a spiritual guide who knew the word. And Jesus says, you're just as dead in sin as they are. You're just as blind as they are. And you too need to acknowledge that you're dead in sin and blind and you need me to save you. And if you acknowledge and agree, then be humble enough to get baptized in this water as a sign to everyone. Israel, I too need Jesus and I'm dead in sin. And I'm not a reliable guide. We all need to turn to Christ. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing, willing to do that? If you're not willing to do that, then you will not see the kingdom of God. You see? So let me ask the question. Since that baptism was specific to a particular time in salvation history and applicable to those people at that time. A baptism that John began with Jesus carried out. That part of the instruction, that water baptism that Jesus said they must undergo, that water baptism, is it applicable for Christians today? Thank you. You got it. 
God bless you. So now Rachel said yes, then Rachel didn't get it. She still didn't get it. Those of you who said no or two, you finally understood how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret the Bible. Not every command of Jesus, even Graham Chan didn't get it. Sad. Not every command of Jesus will be applicable for all Christian, Christians to the end of the age. This particular command is not for us. It was for them at that time and cannot be carried out today. So most of you got it. Two of you didn't. I can't help you. I did all I can to help you understand the context. No, that's not what I said, Graham. Graham, let me repeat it again. That particular water, I was clear, Graham. Please don't, don't play games. That particular water baptism, that particular water baptism that Jesus conjoined with being born of the Spirit is that part of the command, that water baptism, still binding on us today. I thought I was clear. Yeah, Vine, that, we can talk about that some other time. I'm talking about interpretation of a specific passage in its immediate historical grammatical context. You see what I'm trying to get at, Vine? To then mention Matthew 28, 19, which doesn't specify the role that that baptism plays in regeneration, Right? really has no bearing on this water baptism in John 3, 5. I'm dealing with a specific passage related to a specific baptism at a specific point in salvation history to a particular people. That's the point. What I'm trying to show you guys is how to interpret Scripture and how not to interpret Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit guiding us and saving us from error so that we can get the most out of the Scriptures by understanding them the way the Spirit wants us to understand them and not forcing these passages to agree with our traditions. Folks, let me ask you a question. It's been about over two hours on this session. I can do another session on the sons of God in Genesis 6, Job 1 and 2, and Job 38, and Psalm 89. You guys interested in another session, or is this too much, and you're too tired, and I'm wearing you out, and I'm torturing you guys? You guys want me to do another session? Okay, well, I'm going to give you guys a break then. It's now my time, 1.15, 1.15. Okay, pray, invite people. We're going to do a session in 45 minutes. It's 1.15 p.m. my time. We're going to do 2 p.m., 45 minutes. It's 1.15 now. Actually, it's 1.13, but in 45 minutes, 2 p.m. my time, which is 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, which is 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Canadian Time, New York Time. So in 45 minutes, God willing, another session. But please pray, no distractions. Pray for greater clarity, anointing, and unction from the Spirit. Get your lunch, get your drinks, You know, prepare yourselves physically, mentally, spiritually, and invite people. God willing, I'll see you in 45 minutes. Please come back. I want to see this number jump to 300. Don't hurt me. Invite people, Lord willing. I hope this blessed you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Jesus. Wash us in your blood. Forgive us for imperfections and fill us with fire from the Spirit to be on fire for you and protect our loved ones, protect my daughters for your glory in Jesus' name. 45 minutes, folks. It's 1.15 my time, 45 minutes, 2 p.m. Don't forget, Christ is risen, risen indeed.